Hello, in this video we're going to continue with this business of applying the tools of statistical mechanics to model systems. If you have not already done so, I would strongly recommend watching my video on finding the canonical partition function for lattice gases before watching this more complicated video on finding the canonical partition function for the Eisen model. We will be using many of the ideas from that video in this one, and as such you should make sure you are comfortable with all the ideas that were introduced in that video before struggling on with this one. With that brief disclaimer out of the way, I will thus begin. Let's start by reminding ourselves where we are and what we are trying to do. We have derived all the tools of statistical mechanics and introduced terms such as microstate, ensemble and partition function. We are now learning how we can use these tools to study particular model systems of interest. As discussed in the previous video, calculating the canonical partition function using the expression shown at the bottom of this slide is central in many of the examples I will go through. The mathematical equations involved can look pretty horrendous because of the particular details of the problems. It is thus very important that you work through all the derivations yourself and make sure that you are comfortable with the way various symbols are used in these proofs. In other words, you need to make sure you understand what the various terms in the equations that appear in the slides that follow represent in the physical system. As you do this though, you need to remember precisely what we have to do when calculating the partition function. We need to have a Hamiltonian that we can use to calculate the energy of a microstate, and we need to perform the sum shown here over all the possible microstates. Much of the complexity in the equations that follow come because the Hamiltonians for our model systems are reasonably complex, and because summing over the microstates is a little involved. In the slide that follow, I will thus colour code the equations for the partition function. The parts in red will be used to denote the parts of the equation that are summing over the various microstates, while the parts of the equations due to the Hamiltonian will be shown as in blue as shown here. In the video on the lattice gases, we also introduce the following matrix for classifying the sorts of model Hamiltonians that we look at using the tools of statistical mechanics. The first distinction we introduce between model systems concerned whether the particles from which these systems are composed lie on a lattice, like the atoms in a solid, or whether the atoms are more, more free to move about, like the atoms in a gas. We then made a decision as to whether our model will incorporate the interactions between particles or not. In the previous video, we focused on a lattice system in which the particles did not interact. In this new video, we are going to make things somewhat more realistic by incorporating the interactions between the sites of our lattice. In other words, we are going to work with a model system that falls within this quadrant of our matrix. The Hamiltonian that we are going to look at is going to look something like this. This particular Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian for the so-called 1D closed Ising model, which is about the simplest interacting model we can work with. This Hamiltonian is used to model a set of interacting spins that sit on a set of lattice sites that are arranged in, on a ring as shown in the diagram. Much as in the previous model for the non-interacting spins in a lattice gas, each of these spins can be one of two states, spin up or spin down. Furthermore, the second term in the Hamiltonian is exactly this Hamiltonian that we had for a lattice gas. This term describes the interaction between the spins and the applied magnetic field. The first term in the Hamiltonian is new, and it is this that describes the interactions between spins. The presence of this term ensures that each spin interacts with its two nearest neighbours on the ring as shown in the diagram. Furthermore, notice that we must introduce a boundary condition and set the n plus 1th spin variable equal to the first spin variable. Only then will we ensure that the nth spin interacts with the n minus 1th spin and the first spin as it should given the arrangement of the spins on the ring. The 
Let's now introduce this Hamiltonian into our expression for the partition functions. There are two things that we must do prior to doing this, however. First of all, it will prove useful to rewrite the Hamiltonian as shown in blue at the top right-hand side of this slide. This is a trivial rearrangement of the Hamiltonian, however. Pause the video for a moment to convince yourself that this is a valid thing to do. The next thing we must do is think about how to do the sum over the states. Here, though, we can copy directly from what we did in the video on the lattice gas model and write the multiple summation that we have to do in the manner shown on the top left of this slide. Remember that this is still a lattice model, so any change in spin changes the microstate that the system is within. Inserting the Hamiltonian and the sum over microstates into the expression for the canonical partition function, we arrive at the complicated expression shown at the bottom of this slide. As always, though, note that if you break this down and think about it as a sum over states, shown in red, and the Hamiltonian, shown in blue, what we are doing is not half as complicated as it looks. Also note that I have used my trick of in introducing a function, z, that is minus 1 when the argument of the function is 0, and which is equal to 1 when the argument is 1. I do this, remember, so that I can write the summations as running from 0 to 1. And these will then, the values 0 and 1, then map onto the various spin, the values that I can, that the spin coordinate can take, minus 1 and plus 1. From here on out, the rest of this video is not so much about statistical mechanics, as we've all used all the statistical mechanics we need in setting up the equation shown at the top of the slide. Instead, the remainder of this video is about the mathematical trickery that we have performed to simplify the expression shown at the, at the top of the slide. The first of these tricks involves recognising that we can exploit the laws of logarithms and write the exponential of the summation in the expression here as a product of exponentials. In the video on the lattice gases, we then argued that only one spin variable appeared in each of the terms in this product. We thus showed how we could write the multiple summations of a, of a product as a product of multiple summations. We cannot do this the same here, however, as each of the terms in the product depends on two spin variables because our model incorporates the interaction between particles. Having said that, however, we can rewrite the expression for z as shown at the bottom of this slide. Notice that there are two sums at the start of this expression as we need to know, know at least two spin variables, s1 and s2, in order to calculate any of the terms in the final product. Further note that the consequence of this is that in the final summation we have a product of two exponential terms. The expression we arrived at at the end of the last slide is shown again here. It looks horrendous, in fact, one might reasonably argue that, if anything, the expression became more complicated during the previous slide and was not simplified at all. Help is at hand, however, if we look at what we are summing over, the variable Sn. Terms in Sn appear second in the first exponential and first in the second exponential. As such, this whole final summation looks like the product of two matrices. In fact, it is the product of the two matrices shown at the bottom of this slide. If this piece of intuition seems a bit dubious, it is because when it is expressed this way, it probably is. Essentially, we can find an exact solution for the Ising model by using a trick involving so-called transfer matrices. I find that the best way to convince yourself that this approach gives the same result as the summation shown here is to manually calculate all the terms you get from the transfer matrix and the summation shown here for a system containing a small number of spins and to prove that the final explicit summations you get from these two approaches are equivalent. The comprehension exercises below the video will take you through this process, but it would be too tedious to go through this through all this in the slides, so I will continue in this rather unorthodox and somewhat unconvincing manner. 
If we think about the matrix that we will get out when we multiply these two matrices together, the rows of this matrix will run over the various values of the spin, vari the spin variable S n minus 1, while the columns will run over S1. Notice, however, that the previous sum will run over S n minus 1 also, and that the exponentials in said sum, uh, in those exponentials, the Sn minus 1 appears in the second position. We can thus also rewrite the previous sum as a product of matrices. In fact, what I'm trying to get at, and as I stated before, I'm being far from convincing, is that we can rewrite the summation above as the following summation of the product of n identical transfer matrices. In other words, we can rewrite the summation as a summation that runs over the nth power of the transfer matrix shown here. Notice also that the sum that remains runs over S1. S1 appears in the first sum in the expression shown at the top of the slide, and as such, the columns of the matrix run over the S1 values. Similarly, the final exponential term in this expression at the top of the slide contains S1 in the second position, and so the rows also run over S1. Consequently, when we are taking this sum over S1, we are taking the sum over the diagonal elements of the matrix. In other words, we are taking the trace of this power of matrices, which is extremely useful as we can now exploit what we know of linear algebra to find the partition function. As I stated previously, the derivation I have performed to demonstrate that this trace of the power of matrices is equivalent to the summation that emerges when we insert the Hamiltonian into our well-known expression for the partition function is far from, from convincing. As such, if you are confused by what I have done on the previous couple of slides, don't worry. Work through the exercise in the comprehension section below and convince yourself that the trace of the power of the matrices comes out equal to the summation. Given that you are now hopefully convinced that we could write the partition function as the trace of the nth power of the matrix, we now need to introduce tools from linear algebra that we are going to use to solve this particular problem. The first tool we are going to need to introduce is the notion of an eigenvalue and an eigenvector equation. Remember that an eigenvalue is a solution of an equation like the one shown at the top of this slide. We have a square matrix A that operates on an eigenvector V. When it does so, what is returned is simply the eigenvector V, scaled by a constant lambda that we call the eigenvalue. Eigenvalues are important in many fields, not least because if we have an n by n square matrix, it will have n eigenvalues and n corresponding eigenvectors. These square matrices can be decomposed as a product of the three matrices shown here. This decomposition proves useful when it comes to taking powers of the matrix, as we can reuse it to rewrite the square of a matrix as shown here. We then recall that when we take a matrix V and multiply it by its inverse, V to the power minus 1, we get the identity as shown here. Furthermore, if we multiply the identity by any matrix, the matrix remains unchanged. We can thus rewrite the square of the matrix V as V multiplied by lambda, the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues squared, multiplied by V to the minus 1. Let's now look at what happens when we multiply two diagonal matrices together. Obviously, as these two matrices are 2 by 2, the outcome of this multiplication will itself be a 2 by 2 matrix. As shown here, the 1, 1 element of this matrix will be lambda 1 squared. The 1, 2 element will be 0. The 2, 1 element will also be 0 while the 2, 2 element will be lambda 2 squared. 
In other words, to square a diagonal matrix, we just need to square each element on the diagonal. This, combined with what we have done to calculate the square of the matrix A on the previous slide, gives us a quick way of calculating the square of any matrix. We diagonalize said matrix and rewrite it as a product of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, as shown here. We then calculate the squares of the eigenvalues, or any higher powers for that matter, and multiply out the matrices to get the matrix squared. This is good, but it gets better still, as what we really want is the trace of the matrix. And it is well known that the trace of a matrix is equal to the sum of its eigenvalues. The eigenvalues of A squared must be the eigenvalues of A raised to squared. This follows because we can write, um, we can decompose A squared as V lambda squared V to the minus 1. As a consequence of this, the trace of A squared must just be the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues of A. In fact, the trace of any power of the matrix A can be found by taking the sum of the eigenvalues raised to the appropriate power. Thus, when it comes to calculating our partition function for the Eisen model, all we need to do is calculate the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix, raise them to the power n, and sum them as shown here. With this strategy in place, let's now calculate the eigenvalues. Remember that the eigenvalue equation tells us the following, which in turn implies that a minus lambda i multiplied by v must be equal to 0. This can only be true, however, if the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to 0. We must therefore find our eigenvalues by solving the equation shown at the top of this slide. It is easy to show that multiplying out this determinant gives us the following. In fact, pause the video now and prove to yourself that this is the case. When the brackets of this equation are multiplied out and the resulting equation is simplified, we arrive at the following quadratic equation. Pause the video again and take a moment to convince yourself that this is also indeed the case. Now notice that the first term in brackets is equal to 2 times the hyperbolic sine of 2 beta j. And that similarly the term in brackets in the second linear term is also related to a hyperbolic function, in this case the hyperbolic cosine. We thus arrive at the following quadratic equation which we must solve. We can do this using the well-known quadratic equation formula, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. When we do so, we find the result shown at the bottom of the slide for lambda. The coefficient of the linear term in the quadratic equations enters in the two places shown here, while the coefficient of the quadratic term and the constant term enter in the final term shown here. Pause the video for a moment and confirm to yourself that this is indeed the solution you arrive at for lambda when you use the quadratic equation formula. We can simplify this expression for the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix somewhat by remembering that the hyperbolic cosine of beta h squared is equal to 1 plus the square of the hyperbolic sine of the same quantity as shown here. We can also write out the hyperbolic sign in terms of exponential terms. When we do this, we recognise that some terms cancel, and we thus arrive at the following slightly simpler expression. In many of the derivations that we will perform in other videos and exercises, we will consider a system of Ising-like spins in the absence of a magnetic field. In other words, we will set h equal to zero. We will do this both because this makes the mathematics simpler, but also because the physics is actually more interesting when there is no external field. Setting h equal to 0 simplifies this expression considerably, as now the hyperbolic cosine in this term is equal to 1, while the hyperbolic sine is now equal to 0. 
Our expression for lambda thus simplifies down to e to the beta j plus or minus e to the power minus beta j. The eigenvalues for our transfer matrix are thus equal to 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of beta j and 2 times the hyperbolic sine of beta j. Remember that the partition function is equal to the trace of the nth power of the transition matrix as shown here, and that we can calculate this trace by taking the sum of the nth powers of the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. We can thus use what we've just learnt about this matrix's eigenvalues in the absence of a magnetic field, i.e. when h is equal to zero, to write the partition function as shown on the bottom of this slide. We can now, therefore, much as we did in previous exercise, calculate equations of state and expressions for the average energy of a system of Isenstrins by taking suitable derivatives of the partition function shown here. In conclusion, the derivation of the expression for the partition function of the Ising model that I have presented in this video is rather involved. Writing out the initial expression for the partition function is not particularly difficult. We simply have to remember that we need to sum over all microstates, and we need to remember the Hamiltonian for this system. We then use some mathematical trickery and write, rewrite this summation as the trace of a power of a matrix. This step is trit critical, as we then have a pathway to a solution. We begin by finding the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. We then take the nth powers of these eigenvalues. And lastly, we sum the powers of the eigenvalues to get the trace and the partition function. Before leaving this video, make sure that you are able to do all these steps and that you understand the derivations associated with each step that were presented in the video. Thank you for your attention.